Today we are pleased to introduce Lynn Dybel as part of the Wisconsin Historical Museum's History Sandwiched In Lecture Series. The opinions expressed today are those of the presenters and are not necessarily those of the Wisconsin Historical Society or the museum's employees. Lynn Dybel grew up in southern Minnesota and has lived in Stoughton, Wisconsin since 1974 with her husband Bob and their four children. Her many books are centered on the landscapes and natural world of Wisconsin and Minnesota. Lynn has been canoeing lakes since childhood, and as an adult, she learned to canoe whitewater rivers with Bob. Together, they've paddled almost 3,000 miles on the rivers of Minnesota while researching their two guidebooks. Here today to discuss her book, Crossing the Driftless, please join me in welcoming Lynn Dybel. Well, hi, everybody, and thanks so much for being here. Um, I'm honored to be part of this program. It's, uh, it's a really cool program. As Katie mentioned, I did grow up in southeastern Minnesota and uh, then living most of my adult life near Madison, um, we spent a lot of time traveling back to visit my very large extended family who stayed in southeastern Minnesota, <laughs> and which means that um, we traveled occasionally by train or bus, but nearly always by car. 285 miles, 4.5 hours to Faribault. 220 miles, 3.3 hours to Rochester. And then there was that one bike trip. Uh, the, the land that lies between these two homes of mine is known as the Driftless Area. And uh, this, is, this gives you a visual of what the, what the Driftless is composed of. Now, some people say that the Driftless is partly in uh, southeastern uh, Minnesota, but officially, according to Carrie Jennings, who's the uh, Wisconsin or Minnesota glacial geologist, uh, that area was glaciated. So we're going to confine the Driftless to southwestern Wisconsin, a teeny bit of northwestern Illinois. But you can, you'll note. You can see the UR here, uh, and all the lakes that extend above the UR here. And then look at the driftless area, the, the rugged land there. No lakes, just rivers. So uh, that's, that's a, a ge geological reality that uh, comes from the fact that the, uh, all of this land was an ancient Paleozoic plateau. Uh, that's how it was formed. Uh, layers of limestone and sandstone that were once a vast seabed covering uh, much of the upper Midwest. And since that time, the rivers have, in the driftless area only, dissected the landscape and creating those deep valleys and those coolies that are so beautiful in that land. Uh, they've had millennia to do that. Uh, in the glaciated area, by contrast, uh, you find lakes, marshes, drumlins, eskers, and post-glacial rivers. So we have the contrast between those landscapes. Now I'll show you where, where we traveled uh, and why we traveled. How many times has an adventure been launched by a map? It was in a small history center in Minnesota that we first thought of traveling back to our Wisconsin home by canoe. The center stands near Traverse de Sioux, a shallow river crossing on the lower Minnesota River. And it was a Frenchman who drew the map that so intrigued us on that hot summer day that we visited the center. From 1836 to 1840, commissioned by the newly created US Army Corps of Topographical Engineers, astronomer and cartographer Joseph N. Nicolay traveled the rivers and prairies by canoe and ox cart to survey the land that would become Minnesota territory. Wisconsin territory was surveyed in the early 1830s, and thus Nicolay used that data as well to create this map, which the War Department published in 1843. And this map became somewhat of a real estate map for settlers who were looking to move into the Minnesota territory, because he had not only done the map, but he did notes on fertility of soil, on existence of, uh, of arable land. There was, a, there was a ton of prairie in southwestern Minnesota. So he observed all of that. And uh, he, this map 
there's a copy of a, a digital copy I got from here at the Historical Society. It was seeing this map that made us decide to paddle from Faribault, Minnesota, where my family has a house on Cedar Lake, and the house is a settler cabin that my great-grandparents bought in 1883, back to our Stoughton, Wisconsin home. There are no roads on Nicolay's map, as you can see, just rivers. And the Madison Lakes are perched on the very eastern edge of the map. You can see these little dots along the very eastern edge that you are here. Some portage is required for the trip, of course, but people have been traveling paddle portage style for millennia, and this had long intrigued us. Uh, Bob and I like paddling rivers. Uh, we wanted to know what paddling upstream would be like. <laughs> it's one thing to go downstream, quite another to go up. So he's looking at the map, and he's saying, well, look, you know, if we went down the Cannon, and then we went down the Mississippi to Wyalusing, and then we went up the Wisconsin to Arena, and then up across uh, the Black Earth Creek to Cross Plains, portage over into the Madison Lakes, we could get home. We live in Stoughton, which is right on the Yahara River. So I said, so what are you suggesting? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, we can do this. <laughs> Come on. This is an adventure, and we had always gone for adventures. So it totaled, the trip in the end totaled about 359 miles. It took us 12 days, and uh, we, it didn't come out exactly as we had planned, but trips on rivers rarely do. So those are the, the guidebooks that, that we did uh, for paddling Minnesota. There's a series also for paddling Wisconsin done by a fellow named Mike Svab published by uh, Trails Books. So here's our route on the Nicolay map. Uh, you can see the uh, wide part that's like Pepin. That was an exciting part of the trip. And here's, here is one of the, uh, the first of the maps that Bob drew uh, for the book. And he is, these are very precise. He's an engineer by profession. Uh, but he also is kind of playful, so he's got all these uh, interesting little details on the maps, and each little drawing tells a story about that particular episode. So Faribault is Stoughton, and this is the first day of the trip. We went down the cannon just about to the Mississippi. To backtrack just a bit on C to Cedar Lake, where, where we uh, had planned to start. We didn't end up starting exactly at Cedar Lake. We started in the town of Faribault, about five miles away. This is my grandmother in 1898, and that's a, a, uh, an Ojibwe canoe, a birch bark canoe. And here's the same canoe uh, in 2012. Uh, Bob renovated it uh, with the help of a fellow up in, uh, in Woodruff, um, Ferdy Good, who's uh, an expert at these, at these things and how to dig the spruce roots out of the marshes. This is the canoe we took. We did not paddle my grandmother's <laughs> canoe. <laughs> this is a, a Winona Jensen Hull uh, Kevlar, lightweight, not very much freeboard though, so that's why Lake Pepin got exciting. And uh, that's all of our stuff. Please note the portage wheels, they're important. Uh, here's a, a cropped version of the map. This is following the cannon. This is Nicolet's research. He also called it the Lahontan River. Um, it was, the word cannon comes from the of bastardization of the French, uh, which was Canot, Riviere de Canot, and that's, or Eau Canot. Uh, it's River of Canoes because there were a lot of canoes on the river. And it got changed to cannon, and lots of people think that it has to do with warfare, but it doesn't. Uh, on our way down the cannon, the portage wheels are in the front there. Uh, if you look at the bluffs along the cannon, you see a cross section of the Paleozoic Plateau. Uh, at the bottom, St. Peter sandstone, and then a thin layer of Glenwood's shale topped off with Platteville limestone at this point. There are other layers in other areas, but this is, uh, this is what was left there. 
During settlement times, a southern Minnesota wheat boom led to numerous water-powered mills to grind the grain. Uh, local historians say that at least 17 grist mills operated on the Cannon in the 19th century. It's not that long a river. Leaving behind ruins like the Archibald Mill at Dundas, which is a, a really cool looking old building. Not, nothing's being done to it. Now here's a little cross section of history. At the site of Scott's Mill, does anybody recognize what that's the shape of? Shiva, thank you, thank you, yeah. Uh, nearby are the remains of a dry laid uh, bridge abutments, but in the 1970s, the St. Olaf College art student carved this carving of Shiva on the bluff face, merging several layers of prehistory and history. The Paleozoic era stone, that was his material, glacial era erosion, 19th century industry, and ancient Eastern religious iconography. So it's also a great site for young people to try to deface. Uh, early 20th century bridges add another layer of history. I'm very fond of these, these uh, bridges, these truss bridges, because uh, my uh, childhood was spent driving over those. The waters of the Cannon River flowing over a dam at the site in Northfield, Minnesota, once powered the 1856 Ames Mill. This current structure, which is almost 100 years old, now serves no practical purpose except to block the passage of fish. Uh, today, the Malto Mill Company, which has owned the Ames Mill since 1927, produces cereals like chocolate Malto Mill and cocoa roux in the vintage mill building, the original vintage mill building, but not with water power. Post Holdings recently bought the company for $1.15 billion, so it may change. They may tear it down. Now, this is a, a hydro dam on the Cannon, a 60-foot high hydro dam. That was quite a portage because they go straight down. Um, the, it impounds a lake called Lake Billisby, and this is the beginning of the portage wheel story. At the downstream end of Billsby, we float quietly for a moment to watch laughing, shouting teenagers jump from a bluff into the water far below, and then we land a portage. Once again, the canoe makes the overland journey on its wheels, which wobble ominously across the parking lot, and stubbornly refuse to roll when we reach the grass. A few years ago, Bob tried to sell these portage wheels on Craigslist. He was asking $15. A young man drove 25 miles to look at them and offered $10. <laughs> Bob was adamant about his price. The young man wouldn't budge either, and he drove away without buying, which is why we don't have a better set of portage wheels today. <laughs> so <laughs> moving on to Lake Pepin. And you'll have to read the book if you want to know the story that's associated with this particular drawing. Yeah, this is, um, this is a, uh, a bird's eye view, well, sort of bird's eye. It's from uh, uh, Great River Bluffs State Park uh, of the Mississippi. And it gives you a sense of how the Mississippi has changed since the 1930s when it was, uh, att they attempted to corral it with the lock and dam system. So the, what you see in the foreground is the channel, the main channel that's uh, officially called a nine foot channel, but is also dredged to 12 feet in some areas. And behind that, the backwaters. And that gives you a, a sense of what the river looked like before it was impounded and before it was dredged. It was a very complex system and it got really confusing for early explorers. This one's another story. You can see the, in the foreground we have a truck. Uh, that one we'll, we won't go into either. <laughs> so we had, this was in 2009 that we did the trip, and we had uh, a cell phone. It wasn't a smartphone. We didn't have internet access. And we decided that on the Mississippi that we had traveled so many times by road, it would be fun to stay at some of the little places along the way that were right in the river towns. Uh, but we were able to reach our son, Greg, uh, who was, we 
dubbed our river concierge. And he would check, we'd say, oh, we're gonna get a, we're gonna get to Alma tonight. And uh, he and then he'd call back and say, Well, the Alma Hotel can put you up. And I made a reservation for you. And so on uh, we went to Alma. And this is the second chapter of the Portageville story. Halfway down Main Street to our night's lodging, and soon after we dropped the canoe rig over a steep curb cut. Our portage wheels began wobbling in a dramatically new fashion, not a good thing. At the Elma Hotel, we parked the canoe on the sidewalk. Still wearing his life jacket, Bob walks up to the bar, where five patrons in various stages of Sunday afternoon inebriation are seated on bar stools. Our son called about us getting a room tonight, Bob says to the barkeep. You don't need a life jacket in here, offers one of the patrons. <laughs> I don't know about that. Our canoe's right outside on the sidewalk. Oh! <laughs> Everyone, including the barkeeper, hurries out the door to see the canoe. <laughs> you ought to get a motor, suggests one thoughtfully, <laughs> adding that he works on a dredging rig. We chat for a bit about the hazards of canoeing the big river. So about the room, Bob asks the barkeep. You should probably see it first. Up the stairs from the bar, we see why she said that, as the place is being renovated. There's no light in the upstairs hall. Paint is peeling from the walls, and there's one shared bathroom. But the room and bed are clean and comfortable. We say yes and follow her downstairs to the bar. How much do we owe you for the room, I ask? Oh, it's very expensive. About $297, interjects the dredger. $22.16. That includes the tax, the barkeep concludes with a grin. It's just a sleeping room. When we lock the canoe to the dumpster behind the hotel, Bob inspects the recalcitrant portage wheels. One metal support is buckled so much that another bounce down a curb will render the wheels useless, and the other support is twisted. So what do we do about the portage from Black Earth Creek, I ask. We'll figure that out when we get there. Let's get dinner. On our evening walking tour of Elma, we have a tasty meal at Kate and Gracie's restaurant, which is no longer there, sadly a session at the laundromat, and a trip to the pier downstream of the dam to scout tomorrow's exit route. As an afterthought, we carry the wheels to a municipal trash can and drop them in. He should have taken the $10. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, all right, so this is a dredging rig, and this is what they use to scoop out, and then they have a, an adjoining barge that they Pile, pile the sand and then they move it to other places on the river. And they pile it uh, in huge mounds in, in various places. They build islands with it. They do all sorts of stuff because the sand is always moving downstream and refilling the channel. So this is where our dredger was uh, bound, uh, bound to be working. Just on that note, on the river, there's a continual tension between nature and man's works. The river's power reminds us that the things we build in its floodplain, the towns, the levees, the farms, etc., are there only as long as the river permits. Congress built the lock and dam system for commercial navigation in the 1930s, not for flood control, but the Army Corps of Engineers River Commission has been messing with the Mississippi's flow and floodplains for much longer, building levees and wing dams. In 1883, Mark Twain wrote, one who knows the Mississippi will promptly aver, not aloud, but to himself, that a thousand river commissions with all the minds of the world at their back cannot tame that lawless stream, cannot curb it or confine it, cannot say to it, go here or go there and make it obey cannot save a shore which it has sentenced, cannot bar its path with an obstruction which it will not tear down, dance over, and laugh at. That was from Life on the Mississippi. Fortunately, there were those who understood this truth. And in 1924, under heavy pressure from the newly formed Isaac Walton League, Congress had established the Upper Mississippi National wildlife and fish refuge, and that's 261 miles of river between the foot of Lake Pepin and Rock Island, Illinois. No new levees there from now on. The flood of 1965, however, crested at about 20 feet, mocking most existing levees anyway. 
Our fourth day was a four dam day. Elma, Whitman, Winona, and Trempolo. We portaged two of them, locked through two. We passed the confluences of the, the confluences of the Zumbro and the Whitewater. Those are two lovely paddling streams in Minnesota. And the quirky boathouses on Winona's Latch Island. We, some, Bob likes to take a nap in the canoe. <laughs> and he'll have me paddle so that he can kind of stretch out. And that's him napping. Uh, so we ended uh, the next day at uh, Genoa, uh, taking us past the mouse of the Trempolo, the Black, the La Crosse, the Root, and Coon Creek, as well as vi uh, visiting glorious flocks of pelicans to spend the night at Genoa in another Riverside Inn. We were getting spoiled at this point. And the, at Genoa, this was the sweetest thing, the innkeeper, uh, whose name was Anne Zabolio Muirhead, was standing on the side of the river, on the rip-wrapped river bank, where, just below where the train tracks go across, along the, the river there. And she was waving a dish towel to <laughs> signal where we should go under the tracks. She, we could see her from really far away. She's standing there waving the dish towel and saying, OK, you go through there. And then she and her husband met us at the landing that was underneath the railroad tracks and helped us carry our stuff to um, the motel. And that was the, uh, one of the pluses of having a river concierge. <laughs> Next day, we passed the Bad Axe, the Upper Iowa, and the elegant Black Hawk Bridge at Lansing, Iowa, and camped on island number, we get, here we, we're going through the barge traffic which I don't recommend hanging out with. Camped on island number 166, just upstream of Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin. Now, just to back up for a moment, that is a lock. And you can see that they will lock through any a one canoe. If the one canoe is the only one that wants to get in, one canoe gets to lock through. It's big enough to hold an enormous barge. And so we're sitting there, you know, you, you just hold onto the rope. You don't tie up because you drop as you're going down. And so you just let the rope slide through your hands. But so there's all the barge traffic, and there was plenty of it. And here we are at um, uh, island number 166. And on the seventh day, and that sounds a little biblical, but <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> After floating past Prairie du Chien, we turned left and headed up the Wisconsin. Now, has anyone here heard of the Wyalusing River? Yes. Yeah. Wyalusing State Park. Well, there's a, a made up Wyalusing River. It's, a, it's actually a historic river. What direction does the Wisconsin River flow? Southwest. Southwest, right. Has it always? It's a trick question. <laughs> That's the right answer is no. <laughs> Go back almost a million years before the most recent glaciation, which ended about 12,000 12, years ago. The evidence lies along Wisconsin Highway 60 near Bridgeport. And you can see Bridgeport on this map where the highway rides a high bedrock bench called the Bridge, Bridgeport Terrace. And this is one place where there is glaciation in the Driftless area, evidence of it. According to Wisconsin geologist Eric C. Carson, the eastward tilt of that Bridgeport Terrace, plus the narrowing of the river valley as it nears its confluence with the Mississippi, and the shape of the valley wall at the confluence suggests that as recently as 800,000 years ago, the Wisconsin flowed east, probably all the way to the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And there's a lot of geological research being done on that right now, uh, finding the markers, the geological markers of, of the, the Wisconsin's path east. Paddling upstream around the sinuous sandbars of the lower Wisconsin took some learning. And this is our route on the next day between the, that sandbar near the Kickapoo, the mouth of the Kickapoo, and Coom <coughs> Island. 
This is one of the techniques we used for going <laughs> upstream. <laughs> and it was actually a nice thing because you'll probably also notice that I wear the same thing in every uh, picture. And that is true. I wore the same clothes for 12 days. Um, but going upstream is, is quite possible. We were able to go about two miles an hour upstream uh, against about a two to three mile an hour current. And uh, yet we got tired of sitting because we'd be paddling 12 hours a day. And so we, we periodically towed the thing in the shallows. The water was kind of low that year. Uh, this is the bridge at, uh, near Lone Rock. And uh, that it's a steel through truss bridge, and that means that the trusses form a box through which the traffic drives. It's another one of those shapes that I find so appealing, and I think it echoes the shapes of the hills of the driftless. It's um, the uh, and all of those bridges have that that lovely curved arch on top. This is the route between. Coom Island and Lone Rock. Notice the drawing, because you'll see that again. OK, not everyone floats in canoes down to Wisconsin. <laughs> it was the 4th of July weekend. And all, we noted that all the way down the Mississippi, we hadn't seen a single other canoe. Everybody we met and talked with, and there was a lot of people, they were all on dry land. But in the four days it took us to reach the arena landing, we met hundreds of people floating down to Wisconsin on the July 4th weekend. And most told us we were going the wrong way. <laughs> Be a lot easier, people. <laughs> so here's where that sketch came from. <laughs> they weren't given any advice. They were just having a great time. They had actually built that raft in the morning. <laughs> And so we paddled in place for a while chatting with them, and they were just, they were great kids. They were really Gosh. funny. I know, the couch is a great touch. <laughs> so day four on the Wisconsin took us to uh, just downstream of Arena. And uh, that was passing the Highway 23 bridge over to Spring Green. And this is Frank Lloyd Wright territory, as many of you I'm sure know. Wright's home, Taliesin, is in the hills just south of the river here. And his architectural style, deeply rooted in the landscape of the Driftless, echoes the shapes and forms of these bluff faces, their outcroppings, and the low, rounded hills that rise above them. An organic expression of this land where the architect grew up, the materials and shapes derived from the landscape, and at times from the riverscape. Wright built with Cambrian sandstones and dolomites quarried from the hills of the Driftless, and he mixed Wisconsin River sand into his plaster, which is a nice connection. This photograph was taken from Bob's, it used to be called Bob's Riverside, now it's just Riverside Landing, which is a, they have really great burgers, so we stopped for a burger there and went up on the, on the deck, and uh, I, I love the, this view of the, of the Wisconsin. It is my favorite river. Another view of the Wisconsin is taken from Ferry Bluff and Cactus Bluff uh, so that you can see off in the distance the highest point in the Driftless, which is Blue Mound. Uh, can, can you see it on the horizon? OK. This is a, um, uh, a, a point that's about six miles upstream of where we took out at Arena. So, which brings us to the final <coughs> chapter of the Portage Wheel story. And at this point, we had reached the arena landing, but we were trying to find, there are about three different outlets for Blue Mound Creek, which blue, uh, Black Earth feeds. And uh, we were trying to find the mouth of that, that creek. It wasn't easy, the water was low. Today, it isn't easy to find the mouth of that cold creek again. The chameleon shape of the Wisconsin sandbar may be the reason, as the sandbar is always, always changing. So instead of searching for the confluence, we look for a proper place to camp. Choosing a spot on a high sandbar facing the back channel with scattered thickets of willow on vast expanses of open sand, so hot in the afternoon sun that it is hard to walk barefoot. 
that we cannot see the main channel from here makes our camp feel secluded, somehow wilder than our wide open tenting grounds of the last few days. On the wet mud flats that abut the sandbar on the shore side, trails of sandhill crane tracks, each footprint shaped like the letter T, form intricate patterns of line and curves and loops frequently punctuated by dry droppings. As it turns out, we are indeed camped at the confluence, or perhaps more accurately, at one of several points where Blue Mounds Creek drains into the Wisconsin. By studying the shoreline, Bob concludes that one branch of Blue Mounds Creek flows into the Wisconsin under a tangle of undergrowth that is just across the back channel from our camp. To confirm this, we paddle across the narrow channel and step out of the canoe into the water. It is clear and icy. We have discovered Blue Mounds Creek. Back in camp, we bathe in the Wisconsin, lying full length on our backs on the sandy bottom of the shallows. My hair floats on the surface, Medusa-like. I had longer hair then. As I slowly cool off and relax. Later, we dine on oranges, bananas, gouda cheese, and wasa bread, and toast our arrival at the confluence with cups of ice water from the bottom of the cooler and the last of the Oreos. Bob suggests that when we get to Madison in two days, that we spend the night at the Edgewater Hotel on Lake Mendota. <laughs> we can paddle right up to the dock, he says. <laughs> I agree, delighted with this somewhat outrageous idea of staying at a posh hotel on a canoe trip. Two sandhill cranes cross the mouth of the creek, pausing to look our way. A few quick running steps, and they are launched. They depart over the trees, bodies glowing softly golden in the evening light. Long winds, wings silhouetted against the sky, and that distinctive wing beat tempo, slow on the downstroke, quick up, then another long, slow roll and quick snap, and then they're gone. The sun drops behind the bluffs, and the world slowly cools. I listen to the distant cranes call to each other intermittently through the evening, not thinking of anything in particular. Then out of the blue, I recall our long ago abandoned portage wheels and feel a mild sense of dread. <laughs> it was justified. <laughs> we made it only two miles up Blue Mounds Creek before turning around and backtracking to the Wisconsin. The water was too low. Too many deadfalls crossed the narrow stream. Too many thick blankets, they were this thick, of filamentous algae blocked our passage. We became crabby paddlers. <laughs> The portage wheels were back in that trash can in Alma, or we could have portaged the three miles from the arena landing to where the black earth is relatively open. But with no wheels, we sure weren't going to be able to do the 10-mile portage from Cross Plains to Middleton as we had planned. Luckily, we were voyagers with cell phones. Our son Matt, this is a different son, drove to the arena landing and gave his crabby parents a ride to Lake Mendota in Middleton. <laughs> It was a role, it was a role reversal. <laughs> this is Black Earth Creek, beloved of trout fishermen. It runs through agricultural land and thus has its share of obstacles for the paddler. Fenced in cattle crossings, low bridges, and deadfalls abound. But the good news is that the only dam that impounded the creek for 150 years to create Lake Marion was recently removed, and a mile of stream bed banks and floodplain restored to their former contours. Floodplain restoration is going on all over the Driftless. Mile by mile, stream banks are being reshaped into their natural contours on the east branch, branch of the Pecatonica, Timber Coulee, Seas Branch, the North Fork of the Bad Axe, Mormon Coulee. With thousands of stream miles in the Driftless, it's slow but important work, the best hope for Driftless streams. Just to show you in contrast, if you look at this one, see how the, the floodplain goes is level with the, with the water. And here we have the banks. Sediment from agricultural fields upstream is deposited as steep, highly erodible banks in the Cannon River bottoms, eliminating the floodplain. And so instead of spreading into the floodplain when the water rises, the water rips off more and more soil and carries it down to the Gulf of Mexico. Home again. All right, leaving Black Earth Creek, we left the Driftless. The lakes of Madison, strung together by the Hara River, lie just over the Johnstown Moraine into the glaciated landscape, the land that isn't the Driftless, almost home. OK, 
Okay, Glacial Lake Yahara. When the last glacier moved in, it covered the land that is now Madison and the Yahara River Valley with ice more than 1,000 feet deep. Imagine that. We'd be under it. As the ice melted off the land where the lakes of Madison now lie, Glacial Lake Yahara took its place, draining first to the southwest and west through the Sugar River and Black Earth Creek. Glacial Lake Yahara shrank until it filled uh, only a basin bounded by the moraine that now divides the Yahara River and Black Earth watersheds to the west and by the retreating glacier to the northeast. The lake then found a new outlet to the south through the glacial debris covering what is now the river valley. As the water moved downstream and the lake level dropped, a chain of smaller river-linked lakes appeared, the Yahara Lakes. So this is a, um, a place that has been formed in large part by the glacier. I mean, it was the Paleozoic Plateau, but that's long gone. Our last day on the water, deeply familiar lakes and river, we landed the canoe at Stoughton's Division Street Park and walked up the hill to our home. I uh, have just a, one last paragraph to read, and this is kind of a retrospective on it. Sifting through the many mental images I gathered over the past 12 days, I am surprised by some that linger vividly in my mind's eye. The long, low line of a lock and dam ahead slowly coming into focus as we close the distance. The flash of a goldfinch in a riverside willow thicket. The bleakness of a bermed and rock-clad riverbank. The startling beauty of a white steeple rising from the greenery of a Mississippi river town. The intimidating stony hulks of Barn Bluff, Frontenac, and Wyalusing. Our first glimpse of each secretive wooded confluence. The wild, overwhelming tumult that is a train roaring down the river valley. There are about 10 of them a day. The ominous power of a barge tow. I recall with lasting fondness the riffles of the cannon, the flight of the pelicans, the grand movie that is the Mississippi River Valley bluffs, and the golden, soft sand of the Wisconsin. In the end, I realized that I felt rather than observed, the sudden absence of the driftless following our departure from that compellingly rugged landscape. A passage we had made so many times over the years, but which I had never experienced with such clarity and such a powerful sense of connection. And thank you very much for being here.